Not so I can't go that far. Like I said, we had no water, so we had a water delivery system. We had three different, um, they call these shreddies or, or ox carts that would come. These are coming from five to six kilometers away. They'd have to fill up 200 liters, bring it, drop it off, and go back. We started a water treatment plant. We take for granted here in Canada that we can just turn on the tap. We get hot and cold water whenever we want. It's clean. You don't have to do anything to it. This cost me $1,200 just to double filter and treat this water to make sure it's clean because it was horrific. And the people in the communities I work with are always sick. They were kind of surprised working with our project because we did a washing hands thing and we did uh, this clean water. None of them got sick. I was sort of pointing to the fact that they need this kind of stuff or some sort of solution to help them with the water. And I mentioned that we went, I go, I look for where leaders are. Well, the only way you do that is you walk. You walk and you walk and you walk. You walk down the forest, you walk between forests. But we each walked over 2,000 kilometers. We walked a lot. In the last two weeks, we were doing 22 to 24 kilometers per day. And at this time of year, it would have been 42 degrees Celsius, so the exact opposite of now. So we were dealing with heat. It was really tough. I shed 17 pounds in that two weeks. It was incredible. I don't know how my assistants kept gaining weight, but they did. And we're doing it in the daytime at night, because most of the species there were nocturnal, so we'd get up at 1 a.m. and go looking for them. So I found all sorts of stuff. Fortunately, there were lemurs there. We found over a thousand different sightings of lemurs. This is doing um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of walks. Um, we found six of the eight possible species. We expected that the eight that were in the continuous course may be in the fragments, but we only found six of them. But we found that basically if you were a larger fragment, you had more animals and more species, which makes sense. The smaller it is, the less room there is, there's more competition in smaller areas, so you expect there to be fewer species and fewer individuals. This is important because this is what helps um, decide conservation stuff. So when you're looking at protecting forests, use this kind of information to decide which forest we should protect. Should we care about that 0.23 hectare one? Is it important? I found lemurs there. It might actually be important because it might be a way for lemurs to get from one fragment to the next. And so this kind of research is important for those reasons. And sort of segues into the plight of Madagascar. So you can see why I went there to go to Madagascar in the first place, how amazing the, the country is. But you're sort of getting a hint now about stuff's happening there with regards to the ecosystem. So the forests are disappearing, and they're disappearing rapidly. They say that 90% of Madagascar is now deforested. Um, and the most accurate assessment, in the last 60 years, we've lost half of the forest in Madagascar. So what once was a green island, they now call the red island, because of all the soil. Um, it's a red soil, you can see it, you can see it in space. And in tandem with this, you've seen decreasing forests, but you've seen increasing poverty at the exact same time for other reasons. But those two things are in tandem as well. So the problem when you have increasing poverty and decreasing forests is you have more human, wildlife, and you know, uh, interactions. And this can be a positive interaction sometimes, but it can also be a negative interaction. And what I'm learning is that as forests decrease and as people get poorer, you're seeing um, a worse off situation. It makes it worse for poverty. Habitat loss is rampant. Like I said, this is um, what you see when you go to Madagascar in lots of places. And it's not some big company cutting down Madagascar. These are individuals just trying to live. They're trying to feed their children. They're trying to get from day to day, season to season, crop to crop. Um, they're just turning landscapes that were once forced into things like this, which is a beneficial landscape for people because they can grow food, they can grow rice here. But the problem with this isn't a problem now because they're getting food from this. It's what happens later in certain parts of the country where that landscape turns into something like this. And this is bad for the wildlife and bad for people. The previous slide, there was forest and uh, you saw rice fields. Well, here, those rice fields eventually dried up, the um, grass got burnt, and then there was no way for forest to come back, and erosion started occurring. You can see a small crack there. That crack probably happened just a few months or years before the photo was taken. And it will probably erode every year 10, 15 meters deeper, wider. And over time, it looks something like this. This is kilometers wide, kilometers long. It's huge. And the problem with this is there's no planting crops in here. There's no planting trees in here. This is gone. This doesn't help anybody. And so it's trying to prevent this kind of situation from happening. And that's one thing we're hoping to do is just stop this. You can't fill this back up. It costs too much. You're not going to plant trees here anymore. It's just not the spot. So this is the habitat loss problem, and this is the poverty situation. So there's only a few countries in the world where people make less than $2 a day. In Madagascar, 80% of the people roughly make less than $2 a day. 
So that's a big issue for uh, for poverty in Madagascar, and it's highlighted very strongly in this in this you know graph of the nations here. So what can we do about this? We have lemurs that have a problem, we have people that are poor, there's something that should be able to be done. When I first went to Madagascar, I, I, I stayed there for a few years and I decided to do the project I described earlier. And we fell into this village. And this is the village that I then became uh, very close with and they, they supplied basically all the workers for um, all the projects that I do. But when I got there, we thought, man, my research, yeah, it's, it's good because it's gonna help out with ideas of conservation and fragmentation and all that stuff. But it never really helped people in the long term. It was good in the short term, they had some income, they would be able to make some money, that was great. But in the long term, there was no way of helping them. And I thought, there must be something I can do about that. Some way that I can help the communities, in a way, help themselves and conserve at the same time. So I decided to come up with an organization called Planet Madagascar. It's a community development, education, conservation organization. And we're deciding that we're going to work with communities, help them help themselves, in ways that benefit forests and people. Because if it benefits forests, that's great. So then you have 22 million people that need you know, food and water. And so if you don't make a solution that helps both, it's just not going to work. That's just a fact. And at the end of the day, there's no point in, in having forests that are growing when you're having people starve. So there's got to be some solutions. And I want to integrate what we learned from the research into these conservation projects. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We have a website, planetmanagascar.com. You can ask me about this after the talk. We're going to launch four projects in this coming year. We're going to do a Lambus for Lemurs project, a forestry project, some development work, and a documentary. So let me grab my Lamba. This we started in 2010, and we realized that they have these Lambas. These are sort of um, the clothing that a lot of people wear in different parts of Madagascar. And it literally means clothing, the word Lamba. And on Lambas in Madagascar, you often see sort of a message written on it, on the bottom somewhere. You often see depictions of, of things that are interesting to particular areas, and each region has their own style of Lamba. We noticed that none of the Lambas had lemurs on them. And we asked a lot of people, like, why, why don't you have any lemurs on your Lambas? And they're like, well, we just put things we like on the Lambas. <laughs> and and I, I thought that was a, that was a, a half-sufficient answer, because I knew they actually they had no problem with lemurs. They liked lemurs. But, what happened one day was someone asked me, why do I come all the way from Toronto to study lemurs in Madagascar? Why don't I just study my lemurs at home? And it dawned on me, they think lemurs in the area that I work are just like we think of raccoons and squirrels. They're just everywhere, and so they don't really pay much attention to them, kind of like we don't when we walk down the streets, although raccoons and squirrels are pretty cool if we gave them some thought. And so we thought, let's capitalize on this idea that they, don't, they weren't keen on lemurs per se, and let's try to instill some regional and pride in lemurs. Let's put lemurs on the Lamba. Let's put a message in, in their language and their dialect that means a healthy or wealthy forest has lemurs. Now let's do that and then tell them about why lemurs are so cool. So if you ask them where they're from, if someone said, oh, I'm from Gomera, they'd say, and you'd say oh, that's, uh, where's that? They'd say, oh, it's where the Tsini is. It's this beautiful limestone um, formation. It's really cool. And they tell you about all this cool stuff in their area. But they didn't mention lemurs. Well, now the reason that we did these labs, people say, where are you from? Oh, well, we're from the place that has mongoose lemurs. It's the only place in the world you can find mongoose lemurs. So that was part of the education campaign we were doing. It's true, you know, raise awareness, get them excited about it, but also connect the importance of lemurs to the forest. In this case, many lemurs are seed dispersers, so they help the forest grow, and how that helps people. We did a lot of school visits. We did some lemur games with the kids, played some conservation games, <coughs> fragmentation games, weather life games. We did similar things with ROM, a Partners in Protection program, just a few weeks, uh, a few months ago. And following this uh, Landis for Lemurs project, which we're going to do another one here in 2014, we're going to do a good forest project. We're going to take the ideas and the education and roll into actual actions. So in my area, fire is one of the biggest causes of destruction of the forest. You can see we want forests to look more like this and less like that. Fire is used to, to burn grass so that they can graze cattle. They're allowed to do it. It's in a national park, but they're allowed to do that. And that's fine, but the problem is the fire accidentally burns forest. They're not doing it on purpose. So solutions like maybe a fire break, or educating on the time of day or when, based, figuring out the winds, where you would put your fire, things like that. Simple solutions that will help keep the forest there, but also allow them to do what they need to do, which is raise their zebra or their cattle, and make food and money for themselves. We want to do um, some community development work, because I saw a lot of poverty, and I saw a lot of 
simple diseases that could be easily prevented. So I partnered with an organization in the South, and they trained me on some sanitation projects that they do. This is an interesting project called Community-Led Total Sanitation. It's quite cheap because the community does all the work. It's really facilitating them doing their own projects. They take ownership of it. They're proud of it. They like doing it. And it's tackling basic stuff. Most people think, you saw my water situation. I think we should bring fresh water to Africa. Well, that's great. Bring a well to this community. It'll be, it'll be no good in weeks because of the situation with their sanitation. If you can deal with the sanitation first, then you can get the water situation solved. It ends up being a win-win for everybody. So this gentleman was embarrassed. I first went there uh, over a couple of days when he first saw me. He had he was the only member of the community that hadn't built this toilet. They're just pit toilets, small little holes that they, they build thatched roofs around. And so he was embarrassed, and by the second day, he'd already come up with this. He wanted me to come over and take his picture of his new uh, latrine that he was building. But someone else in his community was even prouder. This older gentleman beside me, he wanted me to come take a picture of his latrine, so the entire uh, hamlet came over. They wanted, to, they wanted to show off the fact that they were doing it for themselves. They were proud of this. Before, weeks before, the open deputation was rampant in this community. And now they're open deputation free, which is a really big development goal in Madagascar. And unfortunately, I'm a bit too tall for this toilet, but there's a, there's a women's and a men's sign. They even have a water bottle where you can tip and wash your hands, which is very unusual in parts of Madagascar. So this is a development project that costs almost nothing. You get a water bottle in there, a couple guys cut down some small trees, get some thatch, dig a hole, make sure you just facilitate how you do it, tell them where they should do it, but not uh, you don't do it for them. They do it themselves. We um, are looking at building community relations, so we're partnering with a uh, basketball association in Madagascar just to help them get some equipment, some funds so they can go to tournaments. So getting kids um, engaged in sport, which I'm very passionate about. I think sport is amazing. It's, uh, it's great for a lot of people, and there's no reason they shouldn't have access to it in Madagascar as well. So this is a project that's starting now, um, uh, so if anyone's interested in stuff like this, come talk to me. We're going to do a documentary. We're going to partner with Ecomentaries. We're going to produce two videos. One's going to be a community education video where we educate the community using the video. It's going to be in Malagasy, showing about how fire impacts forests, etc. And the other one's a promotional video for our organization. We'll be doing that later in the year. Now, what can you do? Well, it's not easy to go all fly to Madagascar and all of us set up organizations. Um, it wouldn't hurt necessarily, but I've done that here. And if you're interested, we'd happily take all of your money. We're good at that. We spend it on the projects that we're, we're showing here. I also sell these Lambos. They're $30. You can use them as a sarong. You can use them as a beach towel. I've used it as a towel, a blanket. If you're traveling somewhere hot, it's indispensable. If you've read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, all of you know what I'm talking about. You need one of these. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter. Just support us. Just you know, retweet us, like something. Um, I have photos, all these photos that you saw, unless they were printed, they were all taken by me. Um, I sell them all, and I just put the money to Planet Madagascar. You volunteer with us, you can join our board of directors, all sorts of ways you can help. Now, one really <coughs> cool way you can help is through tourism. When you have good tourism, when it works well, when you have good ecotourism, it's a win-win for everybody. When you engage communities, engage wildlife, bring people in, you can do some great things. So that's important. And I'm partnering with uh, Kensington Tours, and they're offering a trip to Madagascar this year. We've got some brochures and stuff available. And almost all the photos you saw were taken from the places we actually go. We go to the classic parts of Madagascar, see some really interesting stuff. Um, and one place I really want to go is up in the North Mashwala. It's only 2% of the size of Madagascar, but holds 50% of all that biodiversity I talked about before. So half of all those species I mentioned are found in one place, excuse me, in Madagascar. Now, most people go to Madagascar initially because they want to see lemurs or wildlife or some unique um, uh, nature thing. But what I've learned is that's why you go, but often the reason you come back is the people. The cultures there are incredible, and they have a culture of hospitality that I find very fascinating, and I love it. I hired a band to play for the community I showed you before to um, so say thank you for the, for the project and for helping me get my research done. And so we drove in six kilometers through the bush. You know, you saw the, how, how we drive. This was through the forest. And this is what, I, I won't, won't highlight anymore, but this is what they did along the way. <laughs>
what it's like meeting people in Madagascar. They're very engaging. They're a wonderful culture. This was before we even pulled out the Toko Gassi, which is their local hooch or their drink. Um, and this, this was 45 minutes of driving in, listening to music, meeting them. One more thing I want to mention before I finish is that I can't do any of the stuff I do without all of these organizations. I spend half my time writing these people in these organizations saying, please give me money. Please, please let me go do what I want to do. Um, we have the University of Toronto, we have many zoos, we have the ROM, we have all sorts of organizations. I want to highlight Kensington Tours. They've been very helpful with the Planet of Madagascar, offering to run this trip in Madagascar, which I think is great. They're passionate about travel, they're passionate about Madagascar. We have representatives here, you can come take a look at um, the tour. But also the Explorers Club. I'm a membership pending uh, member of the Explorers Club. And I, they um, supported my research in Madagascar. They funded the largest part of my project. And so I was very uh, happy to try to join the, the organization. I have a very active membership here. I attend the meetings every month. So if any of you are interested, I know Peter Rowe, he's the head of the Toronto chapters here tonight. You have that explorer in you. You can go and uh, talk to him and get yourself uh, uh, lined up with the other explorers that are in this part of the world. Um, so again, I want to thank all these people. I want to thank you for coming out and thank God Anthropology for giving me this opportunity.